I'm glad to see a full classroom today. I like this. Good. We are studying cold case Christianity. A couple weeks ago, in the book, if you want to open up your books, it was on <coughs> page a little book. I'm trying to do everything out of a little book. Do you remember where that was at, Joe, where people you wanted to be to encourage? That was page 16. 16. I thought it was. <coughs> I couldn't remember. On page 16, yeah, here it is. People that you wanted to encourage on page 16 in the ham in the book. People you wanted to encourage. Well, we have I have great news today. My Aunt Shirley and my Uncle Danny are going to church. They haven't been in church in how long would you say, Uncle Butch? Twenty or forty years. <laughs> Twenty to forty years. <laughs> That's a while. That's a and they are coming today to Carol. So that makes me super happy. I'm overjoyed. The mother and father-in-law are doing much better. So we to keep them in our prayers. God really is an awesome God. Amen. With that thought in our minds, and ask Brother Eric to open us in a word of prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come here to learn from your word. We thank you so much, Lord, for the, the blessings you continue to give us. We thank you so much, for, Lord, for giving us the blessing of, um, of uh, Jake's um, relatives doing a lot better. And it's, uh, you know, from what I was told earlier, his uh, in-laws are in really good shape right now. And that is a blessing. And we thank you so much, Lord, for each and every day. Because without you, Lord, we wouldn't be able to be here to enjoy all the all these, op uh, these moments in our lives. Uh, keep our hearts and minds open to today's lesson so we can take it out to the world and bear us through you. We thank you, amen. Amen. Today, if you open up your Bibles to John chapter 21, are you going to take this sermon? <laughs> no, I'm not going to take the sermon. I thought about it, but I would figure that'd be nice to Brother David today. Where is David? Downstairs. I, I guess the preacher's abandoning us. He's downstairs. If I could get somebody to read, does anybody in here have a New King James Version? <coughs> Alrighty, I'll read this. Um, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 21, 1 through 9. I like the way the New King James puts this over the English standard. Though. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Is it the Lord? Now when Simon Peter heard that, 
it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Looked like Jesus was doing a little fishing of his own prior to them fish coming in. Correct. <clears throat> he was more successful prior to the apostles than. Correct. I wonder what he used to bait. Yeah. He probably just reached it. <laughs> <laughs> probably. He probably just told the fish he ate to go there. Hey, right there. <clears throat> what is that? You, what is it? Oh. You clean them. Wait a minute. <coughs> You, you catch them, I'll clean them and fry. I think that's that was that must be before my time, Joe. No, that was that was a Top Gun thing. Oh, yeah. Um, yet last week, going over a quick review, we talked about assertiveness and aggressiveness. Brother Larry, don't mean to put you on the spot, but you're in the hot seat. Well, you just did. <laughs> What is aggressive? In one word. In one word? Aggressive. <laughs> How about bold? Uh, more than bold. assertive. You discussed it last week. And you expect me to remember things? <laughs> it's too much. It's after you get to past the age of uh, 65 that you start forgetting. Hopeful. How about I already used it? Aggressive? Bold. <laughs> Bold. Bold. Does everybody agree that assertive is boldness? Yeah. 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 Assertive is to say emphatically. So basically, boldness. being bold, mm -hmm. being upfront, being honest. Boldness, one word. Now, in lesson in session two today, we are discussing thinking circumstantially and test your witnesses. Brother Joe, can you read the first paragraph for us? Uh, page, oh, okay, here we go. Page, <coughs> yes, yeah, uh, 19. Mr. Strickland, how can you be so sure that this man is the same man who robbed you? The defendant's attorney stood up as he examined the witness and pointed to the man sitting next to him at the defense table. His questions were becoming more accusatory. Isn't it true that the robbery occurred well after sunset? Well, yes. It was about 10.30 at night, Mr. Strickland. Seemed to be preparing himself for an attack. Is that aggressiveness or boldness or assertiveness? <laughs> Well, he asked a question, and uh, let's see. The attorney asked Mr. Strickland a question, and the question was, isn't it true that the robbery occurred well after sunset? So he's asking a question. He's really not, he's really not doing anything assertive. He's just looking for information. Mr. Strick, that, that Mr. Strickland's answer, well, yes, it was about 10.30 at night, but, okay, well after sunset. So he says, well, it was about 10.30 at night. So they're just answering questions at this point. However, Mr. Strickland seemed to be preparing himself for an attack. So um, 
if there was going to be an attack, it would have been, been coming from the attorney uh, in his line of question. Well, he knew it was coming. Yeah. He didn't hit it yet. No. It was, it was the end of the question. Too. Right. He hadn't hit it yet. I have a feeling that the attorney was probably being pretty aggressive. You could tell almost by the tone of his voice mm -hmm. when it says he's becoming more accusatory. Yeah, because when we looked <laughs> that at that wasn't just a friendly question. Yeah, when we looked at when we looked at that last week, there's a lot of factors that are involved. It's tone, type of language you use, body language, uh, you know, how you're standing, how you're talking to them. Um, so if if any of you have watched Watch Perry Mason. <laughs> Don series? watches it every day. Does he? Okay. You watch the court. You watch the court proceedings. Even Bull. I like to watch Bull. Yeah. Uh, and so during the court proceeding, you 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 watch this, and you can you can tell. Uh, and Bull, the prosecuting attorney, seems to be the more aggressive one. Always, always aggressive. Uh, and when an attorney questions somebody, are they seated at their table or are they standing up? Now, if there's an if there is a uh, a rebuttal, what does the other attorney do? He stands up. Now, that's would you would you say that's assertive or aggressive? That would be assertive until it becomes aggressive. Yeah, it'd be assertive. Your Honor, I protest. He correctly interpreted the tone of the attorney's question and straightened himself in the witness box. He scratched his arm nervously. I knew that Mr. Strickland was a smart guy and I was curious to see how he would hold up under the pressure. I had been working with the robbery homicide desk when I was assigned to this case, and I knew it would all come down to Mr. Strickland's identification of the suspect. Want me to keep reading? Yeah. yeah. I noticed you're wearing uh, glasses today, but isn't it true that you weren't wearing those glasses on the night of the robbery? The defense attorney began to walk slowly towards Mr. Strickland. His arms crossed, his chin slightly elevated as he glanced briefly at the jury. Aha! <laughs> I had my glasses on to start with, but I got punched and they flew off my head, replied Mr. Strickland as he pushed his glasses up on his nose. After that, I'm not sure what happened to them. Mr. Strickland's testimony started off calmly enough under the direct questioning of the deputy district attorney, but now he seemed to be losing his confidence under the pressure of the cross-examination. How long did this episode with your attacker last? The defense attorney asked. Just a few seconds, replied Strickland. So, let me get this right. You're willing to send my client to jail for years, yet you only saw the suspect for a few seconds, late at night, in the dark, without the benefit of your glasses. The defense, the defendant's attorney was now facing the jury. His question was rhetorical. He made his point and was now watching the jury to see if it had the impact he intended. Well, uh, I'm not sure what to say. Mr. Strickland stammered hesitantly as he sank in his chair. The prosecutor was an energetic, competent attorney who understood the value of this victim's eyewitness testimony. He waited for the defense attorney to return to a seat and then prepared for her redirect. Mr. Strickland, you said earlier that you were robbed by this man. I want to ask you a question. Given your observation of the robber prior to the moment when he punched you, your observations of this suspect's height, the shape and features of his face, his body type, and the structure of his physique. 
I want you to rate your certainty about the identity of the suspect on a scale of 1 to 100. How certain are you that this man sitting here at the defendant's table is the man who robbed you? Mr. Strickland sat up in his chair and leaned forward. He paused just slightly before answering. I am 100% certain that this is the man who robbed me. There is no doubt in my mind. The jury returned a verdict in less than 30 minutes and convicted the defendant, largely on the strength of Mr. Strickland's eyewitness testimony. While the defense attorney did his best to illustrate the potential limits of the victim's ability to accurately describe the suspect, the jury was convinced that Mr. Strickland was a competent eyewitness. Many of my cold cases have hinged on eyewitness testimony, but how can we be certain a witness is telling the truth or was, has offered an accurate description? Learning how to investigate circumstantial evidence and evaluate eyewitnesses is critical to solving criminal cases. It's also critical to determining, uh, critical to determine whether Christianity is true. We know we have a lot of mothers in here. If your kid does something wrong, how many mothers in here know when their kid did something wrong? Can we see a show of hands. How many mothers in here know? Pretty much. Sometimes, not always, but how? Sometimes you do, but not always. Okay. Now, how many fathers do we know have in here that know when their kid did something wrong? You can see it on their face. How many kids do we have in here? know when they've done something wrong. <laughs> Eric, what about Come you? On, Eric <laughs> we got to pick on Eric. You want some stories? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, I was watching you, Patty, to see what your reaction would be. <laughs> well, my mom unfairly raised me with a guilty conscience. <laughs> so I, uh, I got my, um, my midterm grades. And I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to change the, the F's to A's, which is pretty easy, just a straight line. And just kind of do a little... Use that different color ink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that. Was you wow. used it. You, you did it and you used a different color ink? I never said it was smart. <laughs> I, was, I was in grade school. So, obviously I didn't do much thinking about it. Ah, I love it. Oh, of course, Mom was like, oh, great, A's and B's, I'm so proud of you, I'm so proud of you. I'm so sorry, Mom, I didn't mean <laughs> Fessed up, cracked under the pressure of positive. You were, you were, the prosecutor was definitely uh, questioning you. <laughs> but I think that's a very good illustration for us as Christians. How many of us in here, when we do something wrong, have a guilty conscience about it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we were ingrained with from our parents? Or is that something we have when we become a Christian? You know, you, you ask a good question. Um, <clears throat> the ability to choose right from wrong and the guilt that follows it after you do something wrong. You know, I, I think it's an inherent, inherent uh, uh, quality that each human being has and the guilt that goes with it. But coupled with, with the sin and the guilt when you're a Christian <coughs> there's a difference sometimes it's amplified the guilt is amplified because you know you've offended Christ but at the same time there is a I believe a, a joy as a Christian knowing that God will forgive you of that sin, provided you repent, ask for forgiveness, and try harder. I, 
I, I, I think it's uh, because that's where grace comes in. Um, in if, as a child, Eric, in his, in his uh, illustration, he felt bad that he tried to cheat with the grace. So feeling bad, I think, is a form of guilt. Uh -huh. uh, getting in a fight with your brother and putting him in the hospital. And now he's in the hospital. I didn't do that, but my brother and I fought all the time. But, you know, that, there would be guilt. I didn't mean to put you in the hospital, <laughs> but you made me mad. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, prior to being a Christian and after being a Christian, I think the guilt seems sometimes to be amplified because you know you messed up. And even as a new Christian, as you're trying to learn to switch your life around, you still have to get rid of all that stuff. Yeah. You try harder. That's what I want to bring out in this lesson. Let's look at uh, Galatians. Open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 3. <coughs> We will read verse 1 through 12. Does somebody want to read that for us? Oh, foolish delicious. Who has bewitched you? By the way, this is not King James. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit, Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed, it was in vain. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by healing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. How far do you want to go? Three twelve. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one justified before God by the law. The righteous for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. I think that ties in perfectly with what we were just discussing. What does everybody gather from that section of Galatians we read? Can anybody... No longer under the old law. Correct. There's more to it than the old law. A little more to it. <coughs> My faith here justified, just like it. More? No more. <laughs> there's, there's one word, I'm, there's a couple little things I'm trying to get brought out from this passage. <coughs> Either or. I like we're just discussing about. I like the way he asked the questions. Correct. He asked. That's questions. what I'm going at. He asked, he asked several questions. Uh, uh, from one to five to call attention to. That's that's the questions he asked 
how many of them questions do we ask as Christians? I believe when we're Christians or when we've been raised in a Christian family that we, not to throw you on the spot, Brother Eric, but throwing you on the spot. When we have a man under the bus. When we have a guilty conscience about something, <clears throat> how many of us feel the same way? How many people in here, when they've done something wrong, have a guilty conscience about that? Can I, can I, can I tell a story? Make it quick. Okay. <laughs> Some of you may have heard this story, but I bought a snowblower many years ago, a big one, and I sold the small one, or gave the small one I had to Noel. But in the course of that, I hid that snowblower from Pam for a week. <laughs> Most of you I told that I bought it, but Pam didn't know anything about it. And that was the week that she received an award for writing uh, story she got it from the Writers Guild here in Tuscarawas County and I said I'm not going to tell her because I don't want to I mean she's getting she is getting a notable award uh, for her story was it Bentley Bentley in the what I don't know <laughs> Bentley in the something it was about a duck and so I waited and I waited and then Saturday morning I made her breakfast and everything and this had been weighing on me because I knew eventually she's going to find out. So I said, uh, I got something to tell you. And she goes, yeah, I know. You bought that snowblower, didn't you? You've been walking around here with your tail tucked between your legs all week. <laughs> so at least I got it off my chest. And I goes, yeah, but it's a real good snowblower. <laughs> well, what are you going to do with the other one? Because I told you I'm going to give it to our dog. Now that kind of, that's, that's a good illustration. Now I get to throw Joe under the bus. But he's used to being on the Oh yeah, several times. <laughs> now, how many men and how many people we have in here that are married, how many people have hid, st hid stuff from their wives waiting for the right moment to tell them they did something? I, I didn't tell my wife I bought another pulling tractor until I was already, it was already there, already getting built. So that was a good thing. But was it really? No. No. Because that was a lot of money. Now, the questions we have for this particular section here, think about recent news, re news reports you have heard involving criminal cases. In any of these reports was the term circumstantial evidence referenced. Do your best to define it. What is circumstantial evidence? I gotta look at the definition. I gotta cheat. I'm gonna cheat. That's what they had on OJ Simpson. Yeah. Correct. So the word circumstantial evidence means is there proof to back it up? Is there enough proof to convict? Okay. Now circumstantial evidence is that evidence? It's indirect evidence. Correct. Is that evidence that has a direct bearing on a case sometimes? Could. Can. Could. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it doesn't have to be. Uh, was, was, Terry, was the glove that they brought into that O.J. Simpson case, was that circumstantial evidence or was that evidence? Do you remember? It, it was uh, evidence, but they said he planted it there. Was part of the problem. Okay. Now, do we have circumstantial evidence 
for Christ? Yeah. Plenty of it. How many, how many of us in here believe that's circumstantial evidence? Everybody. How many people in here understand that circumstantial evidence for Christ? How much you into a little bit for? For Christ. So How many of us understand all the circumstantial evidence? What convicts one piece of circumstantial evidence? Would one piece of circumstantial evidence convict a criminal or convict you of guilt or guilt by association? Is it just one piece? Yes, it can be. It can be, depending on how strong that circumstantial evidence is. But, and that's a big one, what helps convict? Multiple. Yeah, multiple. And in <clears throat> Christianity, cold case Christianity, there's enough circumstantial evidence that's brought forth that will convict a person of the truth of Christianity. Going back, I'm, I'm glad Patty was in here today to give us the lowdown on Eric. <laughs> <laughs> we get to throw Eric under the bus some more. Oh, guys. yeah, well, yeah. He lives under there. <laughs> no, I have no shame. <laughs> now, the circumstance, now, the circumstantial evidence that Eric changed his F to A's, is that actual circumstantial evidence? Or do we know that that's 100% evidence that he did that? It was circumstantial until he, <laughs> until he said, okay, I did it. Okay. I did it, but he did it in a different color, so there was something going on. There. But, uh, but however, I was going to say, he could have paid somebody to do it for him. I could have done that. Which yeah, brother? Yeah. Brad. Brad. Whichever one needed money at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hand them the red ink. <laughs> he said, "This was a great, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. Mom will fall for it." Now, how many of us in here, when we do something wrong, we try to hide it from God? That's what I was going for. Okay. We, as, we as humans, as Christians, and those that are not Christians, there's nothing you can do in this world, in this life, to hide from God. There's nothing. Was there, is there any, I'm trying to think of, uh, <coughs> some Bible characters that that tried that. I can think of two. Adam and Eve tried. <laughs> okay, yeah, they tried. Adam Those and Eve were the tried. two I was thinking of. Yeah, Adam and Eve. What about Jonah? Yeah, Jonah. Well, he ran from God. He ran from God. Oh. Well, uh, he played it with. Yeah. Well, Isn't that Abraham? Abraham's sister, sister. sister, yeah, with the king of Egypt. Yeah. Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> the one I was hoping somebody would bring out first was Adam and Eve. Yeah, which I thank Sister Kate for bringing yeah. that out. What did he say to them? What did God say? Have you eaten which one? We, we, which one? We heard you in the garden, so we hid. Yeah, we hid ourselves because we knew we were naked. Who said you were naked? Oh, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, we threw this. You build a car. We threw this in the fire, and I jumped this golden cat. Yeah. I wish I was a mouse there to see that. That was probably the shortest conversation God ever had. Moses probably looked at his brothers as you were smoking. What? <laughs> <laughs> now, Adam and Eve, we all know what Adam and Eve did in the garden. 
They could do anything in the garden they wanted to do. What was the one thing they couldn't do? <laughs> now, why did they do that? Temptation. 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 More than temptation. If you tell someone they can't do something, they only want to do it more. That's what I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. If somebody, if I tell Brother Larry, love you, thick on you. If I tell Brother Larry that. He can't be an elder anymore. <laughs> Bad illustration. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get. How many people in here would want that? <laughs> How many people overrule Brother Larry for that? Everybody. There's two and there's a lot more that say, yeah, he's still an elder. But that's the illustration I'm getting. That's, is that circumstantial evidence? Or is that real evidence? Well, you have more than one. With no, 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 no. If I, the dumb truck driver, said that Larry can no longer be an elder, how many people would overrule that? Oh, quite a few. Yeah. Okay. Now, is that circumstantial evidence, or is that, or is that real evidence? Oh, you'd have to present your case for the circumstantial evidence and say, this is why he should not. What are so, the reasons? Yeah. What are your reasons? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's what I'm trying. That's what I want to bring out in this. With Adam and Eve, we know by Scripture that Eve sinned first. I'm going to pick on my way. You can and, hit him after class. <laughs> but we know that Eve sinned first. And she brought Adam in with her. But what was Adam's response to that? <laughs> he blamed his wife. And she blamed the serpent. Because what did he tell God? You made her for me. Yeah, this, this one when you gave me. Yeah. I went up for that one over pretty well. Now see, that's that's something that I'm wondering about. How many times do we as Christians blame God? For things that happen in our lives, I, you know what, um, Jake, you, you you bring up a good question because usually, if something happens like that with your question, it has to deal with some form of loss, and depends on how great that loss is, and it deals with anger and grief and someone who may be new to the faith might be more angrier than someone who was well grounded in the faith um, but we we all of us have heard of cases where that anger does exhibit and it does exist even with folks that are well grounded that might even cause some to Now, the question I'm going to throw out is kind of a complicated question. How many of us think we can run and hide from God? How many of us have tried? How many of us have wanted to run and hide from God? <laughs> Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> but are all the questions the same? Right. 
probably yeah based the ground it yeah psalms 139 talks about that correct so yeah. i was hoping somebody bring out yeah psalms 139 where where can i go from my presence mm -hmm. there's only one word nowhere <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're at we as christians have nowhere to go we cannot hide from god we cannot hide from our father now this this lesson here is dealing with a witness are we witnesses for christ yep do we believe that how many of us in here with a show of hands how many of us believe that christ died for us how many of us in here believe that we would give our lives for somebody else how many of us would give our lives for somebody else would you give your life up for me would you yes. give your life up for brother Mike yes. you said yes <laughs> that's, that's where we as Christians have the biggest advantage in our Christian lives. We have the ability to know that if we listen to God, we obey what God says, we strive to do our best to live up to that example of Christ we have a hope of where yeah. heaven. now how many of us in here want to go to hell if there is anybody we need to work on it. you know your question your question about dying for someone yep okay uh, scriptures talk about, you know, Romans talks about that. Also in Hebrews. And, but here's a question that you really have to think about. How many of us are willing to die for Christ? That's the big question. And that death doesn't necessarily mean a physical death, dying, but it does, it does uh, uh, describe something that what okay. something that uh, we we are supposed to do actually every day called you know we do that when we're baptized and uh, carrying your cross pick up your cross and follow me how often daily daily every day, every day. that's the gist of being a witness for Christ. That's the gist, that's the basis of full case Christianity. How many of us in here would be willing to give our lives up for Christ? How many of us would give our lives up for our spouses? Well, you can marry her, yeah. Yep. For him. Well, I don't know yet. That's still to be determined. But that's where we have the one word that the world does not know about. What is the one word that we have as Christians in this room that are Christians that we have that the world doesn't have? Grace. 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 Who? <laughs> what does Romans three twenty three say? For all all sin will fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. We've all done things wrong in our lives. But when we think about what we've done in our lives, how many of us? look at the evidence that we've done in our own lives and realize that we've made big mistakes in our lives. <laughs> I think all of us have. 
With that, I'm going to ask Brother Larry to close us in a word of prayer. Father, Father, we are so blessed to be here today partaking uh, this discussion on circumstantial evidence. And Father, we know just by looking at your word and through the blessings that we receive as Christians that you are God and Christ is the Son and he died for us. And we have, with our faith, we have in your grace we have eternal life waiting for us. Uh, so Father, we thank you for that and we pray that we dwell on what we have discussed today and uh, uh, live it daily. Thank you so much for Jake. Thank you for our discussion. And thank you so much for Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>